points. I Beginning in 1980, the New York Islanders won four straight Stanley Cups. Thus, they entered the 84 playoffs driving for five and attempting to equal the five straight Stanley Cups of the Montreal Canadiens. The Cup rested at the Montreal Forum from 1956 through 60. Toe Blake presided over the Habs' reign as coach. John Beliveau was but one future Hall of Famer who performed for those teams. Another was acrobatic netminder Jacques Plante. In 1984, the Montreal legend became the New York Islanders' target. As if to protect their ancestors' place in history, the modern-day Canadians wrote the first big story of the 84 playoffs with a shocking first-round upset of the Boston Bruins. Previously unknown goalie Steve Penny burst upon the scene with save after spectacular save, allowing only two goals in the three-game series. Offensively, the Canadians struck quickly. Mario Tremblay scored at the 16-second mark of game two. And he tallied 46 seconds into game three. matchup of Quebec rivals was ensured when the Nordiques swept past Buffalo in three straight games. Former Sabre J.F. Sobe scored the winning goal of game three. Another first round sweep was achieved by Washington. The Capitals downing Philadelphia for their first ever playoff series victory. Meanwhile, Islander rookie Pat Flatley ran into Ranger Captain Barry Beck to symbolize a dramatic clash in New York. Flatley's crunching check did more than disable Beck. It helped to set up Brent Sutter's winning goal as the Islanders came from behind for a 4-1 victory that saved them from elimination and forced a fifth game. Seldom, if ever, has there been a better or more dramatic contest in an early round playoff series. The Islanders were less than a minute away from a 2-1 triumph when Don Maloney forced overtime with his controversial goal. The Islanders suggested that Maloney's stick was above his shoulders. Referee Dave Newell decided otherwise, and overtime gripped New York. It lasted eight minutes and 56 seconds and produced some of the most entertaining hockey scene in many years. A patented rush by Bob Bourne of the Islanders lifted the fans out of their seats. But in a game that could have had several other endings, the one that counted came like this. Here comes Bosse. Over the line to Bosse. Bosse trying to get it back. And the Rangers come out. Can you believe this action in overtime in a fifth game? Maloney in front. Billy Smith. Bossy played it in. That's Tonelli going after it. Into the corner, Paley lost it. Sutter! Picked out by Ben Hamlin. Shot scores! The Islanders have done it. The Islanders fall. Oh, they have won it in overtime. 3 2. It's over. And the match for the Islanders. Continues Meanwhile, in the Campbell Conference, the Edmonton Oilers were sweeping Winnipeg for the second straight year. But they needed overtime in game two, and this goal by Randy Gregg. And the third game win wasn't indicated until a goal late in the second period by Dave Semenko that broke a one-all tie. There was human interest in Calgary's first round win over Vancouver. In the fourth and deciding game, Paul Reinhardt of the Flames scored three goals and celebrated more than a hat trick. He was happy just to play after missing 53 league games with a serious back ailment. Jorgen Pedersen was the overtime hero as St. Louis subdued Detroit in four games. The Minnesota Chicago series went five. Al Secord scored two Chicago goals in the first one to hide the memory of an injury-filled season. But game five was decided in Minnesota's favor with the help of George Ferguson's goal. He had only six during league play. The Islanders' next test came from Washington in the Patrick Division Final. And the Caps' perseverance was demonstrated by Craig Lachlan as he managed the winning goal with 102 to play in the opener. The Islanders' crown was shaky as game two went to overtime. But relief for the champions came in the form of Anders Keller's winning goal seven minutes and 35 seconds into the extra period. 
Islanders never looked back as they won the next three games to dispose of Washington. Flatley, so impressive as a rookie, tied game five. And later scored the goal that stood as the winner. The Adams Division final between Montreal and Quebec was dubbed La Guerre Civile, the Civil War. An overtime goal by Quebec's Bo Berglund even the series at two games apiece. It would end in six in dramatic and sometimes disturbing fashion. Peter Stastny scored the only goal of the first two periods, and between the second and third periods, an ugly brawl produced events such as this. Quebec also struck the first blow when hockey resumed. Michel Goulet gave the Nordiques a two-goal lead, and it looked as though the series would return to Quebec for a seventh game. But the Canadians fashioned a remarkable comeback. Veteran Steve Schutt started it. And continued it after a nifty pass from Mats Naslund. At the 12-14 mark of period three, Bobby Smith passed to Rick Green. He put Montreal ahead and goalie Daniel Bouchard wasn't the only one bewildered. John Shabbat carried the Habs' lead to 4-2. And the Canadians went on to beat their arch-rivals 5-3 to the chagrin of Quebec coach Michel Bergeron. In the Campbell Conference, both division finals produced seventh game excitement. St. Louis threatened to upset Minnesota with a shorthanded goal by Mark Reeds for a 3-2 lead late in the third period. But just 15 seconds later, Willie Plett got this surprising equalizer from outside the Blues' blue line. The overtime tested the nerves of both teams for six minutes. Until Minnesota's Steve Payne picked up a loose puck at the boards, swooped to the net, and tucked a backhander behind Mike Liu. Payne and the North Stars celebrated a return trip to the Campbell Conference Final after a two-year absence. Edmonton's route became unexpectedly rocky against Calgary. The Oilers started well with a 5-2 win, thanks to a pair of goals by Wayne Gretzky. But the Flames grabbed game two on an overtime goal by Canadian Olympic graduate Carrie Wilson. Earlier in the game, Wilson had counted the first Stanley Cup playoff goal of his short career. And the winner made it a memorable evening for him and a fresh start for the Flames. They took the series to the limit with another overtime goal in game six. Shot knocked down at the line by Jamie McCown to Quinn or Lanny McDonald. It goes in behind the net. Beer trying to feed it in front. And it is knocked down in front of the goal. A lead pass for Gretzky. He was tied up by Baxter and McCowan comes back. McCowan working into the corner. Loses it. Now McDonald gets it. He takes the shot. In the seventh game, the Flames led 4-3 in the second period, but were undone by a stretch of 58 seconds. Glenn Anderson tied the score. And the Oilers then struck for the winner, which nobody really saw, as Ken Linsman created a mess in front of the net and forced the puck over the line. The Edmonton Oilers, wanting another date with the Islanders, had one with Minnesota first. The North Stars and Oilers faced off in the Clarence Campbell Conference Final. Wayne Gretzky collected a first period goal plus three assists to pace Edmonton to a 7-1 opening game victory. Number 99 and Yari Curry made it look easy for the seventh goal. Game two was different though. The North Stars played better and were tied in the third period when Gretzky scored this disputed winning goal. The puck was stopped by Don Bolpre, but in the opinion of referee Bruce Hood, the puck was over the goal line as it was being cradled by the Minnesota netminer. The series switched to Minnesota for game three and the North Stars built a 5-2 second period lead on goals like this by Mark Napier. 
Minnesota scored four times while Edmonton's Dave Lumley was serving a major penalty. Like Napier, Neil Broughton counted twice. But the Oilers staged a mighty third period rally, outscoring the home side 5-0. Ken Lindsman's goal was the winner. And Gretzky completed the comeback. Not on this breakaway, as he was hauled down by Gordy Roberts. But he did connect on the penalty shot opportunity that followed. The fourth game was far from routine as it produced the best hockey of the series, including many excellent saves by Grant Fuhr. Back in action after sitting out the previous contest. The North Stars were blank till the midway mark of the third period. And by then it was too late as the Oilers were two goals ahead. Again, Ken Lindsman scored the winner. And the Oilers won three to one for a four game sweep. And Captain Gretzky raised the Clarence Campbell Bowl. The Stanley Cup still remained with the New York Islanders, but again in the Prince of Wales Conference Final against Montreal, their grip on it appeared loose. The Canadians continued their excellent defensive play and added to a 1-0 lead with this third period goal by Matt Nasler. And this one by Steve Schutt for a 3-0 win. Schutt's deflection of a Chris Chelio shot from the point was perfectly executed. Game two saw Naslin provide another important goal for the Canadians. This the winner in a 4-2 victory that tested the confidence of Islander coach Al Arbor yet again. But home at the Nassau Coliseum, the champions righted themselves. Thomas Janssen's power play shot from the point put the Isles ahead to stay. Greg Gilbert's goal completed a 5-0 lead halfway through the second period and a 5-2 win put the Islanders back in the series. Game four featured this breakaway by Naslin with the score tied one all. Gord Deneen of the Islanders was called for hooking. Arbor's vote didn't count and Naslin received this penalty shot. Billy Smith made the stop look easy as perhaps it was and the Islanders went from there to a 3-1 victory. Here's how the winner was described by Danny Gallivan. Here come the Islanders in there. Billy Carroll knocked in on the boards right under front of Bossy. There's a stop. Big save by Penny. And the Islanders almost took the lead there. There's the left wing pass, and Shub is not going to be able to get it. Morrow has it. Three minutes and 25 seconds left in the second period. Morrow over the line. Shot rebounds. Down it goes right in front of Bossy. The Islanders carried their momentum back to Montreal for game five. A dandy move by Brent Sutter established an early 2-0 lead in another 3-1 decision. Sutter made Steve Shutt look like the forward he is and beat another Steve Penny with an accurate shot. The Islanders closed out the series at home in game six with Bossy scoring twice. In the first period for a 2-0 lead. Then in the third period, after a nifty steal by Greg Gilbert. The final goal of a 5-2 win that put another Prince of Wales trophy into Captain Denny Potvin's hands. And then came the final, the return match, Edmonton versus the Islanders. The opening game on Long Island featured sensational goaltending by Grant Fuhrer of the Oilers and Billy Smith of the Islanders. Smith set the tone five minutes into the game when he robbed Yari Curry, who was right on the edge of the crease, with a great chance. Fuhrer was making similar stops at the other end. 
And even when he needed help, he got it from defenseman Charlie Huddy, a so-called second goalie. But rarely was one not enough in this game that appealed to everybody. The first two periods were scoreless, but hardly without action. Paul Coffey went from one end to the other, only to be foiled by Smith. And Coffey's counterpart with the Islanders, Denny Potman, did the same thing with a similar fate because of Grant Fuhr. Then there was the renewal of a year-old confrontation between Smith and Glenn Anderson of the Oilers. In last year's final, Anderson had been given a major penalty for high-sticking Smith, who feigned injury. The referee at the time was Andy Van Helleman, who passed judgment this time as well. I was on that side, Billy. I thought he just glided. I was trying to take my knee up. I didn't even think he brushed him. He just brushed him. Anderson didn't receive a penalty. The goaltending battle continued, with Fuhr encountering his busiest spots of the evening. A save on Brian Trotche looked to be his best. Or was it this one that robbed Brett Sutter? The goalless tie was finally broken early in the third period by an unlikely scorer. Edmonton's Kevin McClellan converted the centering pass of Pat Hughes into the game's only goal. And McClellan could only think back a few months when he was with Pittsburgh, as far away from the Stanley Cup final as could be. The Islanders kept striving for a goal, but if Fewer didn't blunt them, the end boards did. Ironically, the Islanders were the victims of Fewer's brilliance this time after beating Edmonton in the opener a year ago on a shutout by Billy Smith. Game two began with as much action as kids bring to table hockey. In the very first minute, Brian Trotje did what the Islanders couldn't do in 60 minutes two nights earlier. He put the puck past Fuhr, did it with his skate. However, there was little doubt that the puck deflected in because of Trotje's normal motion. But the Islanders had a one goal lead. Fuhr was still perfect at grabbing or stopping puck shot by sticks, however. He stopped Trotje here and he showed cat-like reflexes to turn aside Clark Gilley's scoring chance. However, the Islanders just kept coming, and before six minutes had elapsed, Greg Gilbert freed himself from a traffic jam to flip in New York's second goal. A rooftop angle provides the best glimpse of the Gilbert goal. Oilers reached the scoreboard shortly after a face-off on a shot by Randy Gregg. But before the first period ended, Gillies began a memorable night for him with some strong forechecking that led to a goal that turned game two into a rout. Al Arbor and the Islanders had things their own way from that point on. Trache was getting all the breaks from skate blades on this night as he scored his second goal taking full advantage of a pass that went quickly from referee Brian Lewis's skate to his stick. After that, the night belonged to Gillies. With Glenn Anderson serving a penalty for high-sticking Billy Smith, Gillies counted his second goal, granting fewer no chance after a thrust by Potvin. In the third period, Gillies registered another power play goal made to look easy. And so he completed his hat trick. The first pass went from Gord Deneen to Paul Booth at a game apiece. The teams traveled to Edmonton for the next three games, the first of which would be handled by referee Dave Newell. Though neither he nor anybody else knew it at the time, this was to be the pivotal game of the series. Mark Messier's check of Ken Morrow brought the first big cheer from the Edmonton fans, but the Islanders got the first goal. And again it was Gillies with his 11th of the playoffs. He had only 12 during the regular season. Then came two chances for the Islanders to take a two-goal lead. Pat LaFontaine broke in alone, but decided to pass instead of shooting. And Fuhr was quick to anticipate that. 
Then came a great save by Fuhr on John Tonelli's breakaway. Thanks to Fuhr's brilliance, the Oilers were able to get even on Kevin Lowe's goal. Lowe drew Smith out of the net for his third goal of the playoffs. The one-all tie was broken in the second period by, guess who? Gillies, as he matched his regular season total with a quick wrist shot that completed his give-and-go play with Trache. At this point, the Islanders had outscored Edmonton in the series 8-3. But some six minutes later, the play that will be remembered above all others gave a shot in the arm to the Oilers. Messier took charge with the puck and turned the series in Edmonton's favor. The undressing of defenseman Deneen was followed by a perfect shot to the short side. Meanwhile, Edmonton was beginning to suffer physically. Dave Hunter was knocked out of further action along the board. And Grant Fuhr became a casualty on the wrong end of Pat Hughes' board check of Pat LaFontaine. But then came the critical 19-second span late in the second period that produced the ultimate turning point of the game and the series. At the 19-12 mark, Glenn Anderson gave the Oilers their first lead since game one. Anderson's sixth goal of the playoffs was the result of some perseverance by Gretzky behind the net. As number 99 succeeded in poking the puck loose from Potvin, Play began with Anderson's pass to Charlie Huddy and ended with Anderson's key goal. Just 19 seconds later, the Oilers stunned the Islanders with another goal. Paul Coffey's alertness to jump to his own rebound brought a 4-2 lead, just when the Islanders were ready to take a tie score to the intermission. This swing and miss by Billy Smith foretold his third period story. The dominating Marc Messier added to his Conn Smythe Trophy credentials with his second goal of the game. Edmonton Checkers turned scorers again as Dave Lumley helped with Kevin McClellan's second goal of the final. At 6-2, Al Arbor took Billy Smith out of the game and put Roland Melanson into the auditor net. Roley, the goalie, was greeted by Dave Semenko's goal. Billy Smith and the New York Islanders could only watch and wonder what had happened. The Oilers skated out for game four with Andy Moog as their starting goaltender, the first true indication of the extent of Fuhrer's injury. But nothing could alter the confidence shown by Glenn Sather and the Edmonton fans. And the biggest reason for a cheer came in the game's second minute. Gretzky's breakaway produced his first ever Stanley Cup final goal. And the Oilers were off and running. Willie Lindstrom made it 2 to nothing at the 3.22 mark of the opening period. The Islanders replied with a nice effort by Greg Gilbert and goal getter Brent Sutter. But it was left to Marc Messier to apply another crushing blow to the champions. His goal late in the first period seemed to demoralize New York, and the Edmonton crowd sensed the aisles were fading. Oilers put them away with three straight second period goals. Lindstrom's second was helped by Messier and Coffey. Pat Conacher, replacement for the injured Dave Hunter, scored a goal that he'll never forget. Then it was Andy Moog's turn to prevent one. He waited out Islander rookie LaFontaine and gave him nothing to shoot at. And as so often happens, a close call at one end was followed by a goal at the other. Coffee scored for a 6-1 Edmonton advantage. Butch Goring's name was added to a list of Andy Moog's victims. But the Islanders did get one back before the period ended. 
Flatley, one of New York's very best playoff performers, counted his ninth goal on a deflection of Gilly's shot. Gretzky closed out the scoring with the only third period goal reminiscent of Kevin Lowe's marker in game three. And it was sinking fast. Prior to game five, the Oiler fans wanted nothing less than the Stanley Cup then and there. Gretzky put the dream two large steps closer to reality with a pair of first period goals. Once more, he was successful in a breakaway. Then he took a pass from Yari Curry to spell the end of Billy Smith. Al Arbor again tried Melanson to change the fortunes of his tired team, but early in the second period, Ken Linsman connected for a 3-0 Edmonton lead. Then on a power play, deliberately and confidently, the Oilers moved the puck around for Yari Curry's goal and a commanding 4-0 lead. The third period wasn't the cakewalk to glory the Oilers might have hoped for. Pat LaFontaine directed the Oilers' last gasp with suddenness in the opening minute. He scored at the 13-second mark. And he connected again at 35 seconds, deflecting a shot by Clark Gilley. Suddenly, Glenn Sater had reason to look and confirm that a lot of time remained. But Andy Moog held firm, and the Islanders' last real hope went out the window this way. With less than four minutes to go, they came close to a third goal. But Flatley was called for dumping Moog in the crease. A penalty with three minutes left made it obvious the Islanders' raid had ended after four years, and Arbor seemed to know it. 20 seconds to play. Islanders fight for it on the board. The five-year plan of Oiler owner Peter Pocklington was right on target. Messier was honored as the outstanding performer of the playoffs, Con Smythe winner, and he couldn't hide his joy. Wayne Gretzky accepted the Stanley Cup from NHL President John Ziegler, and he made it obvious he had never been happier. Edmonton turned out to greet its heroes. The architects, Hocklington and Sater, were followed by Marc Messier. His goal in game three still etched in the mind.